Coming up... The designs that I use, the ancient ones, that's art that someone hundreds of years ago made. And so all I'm doing is is duplicating, so to say, what they've done, and I'm showing off what good artists we had beforehand. Cherokee gourd artist Verna Bates unmasks the inspiration behind her award-winning designs. And Cherokee fashion model Colby Britton goes to work in the Big Apple, chasing big dreams. I just try to live every day and just realize that I'm really blessed with what I have and that, you know, if something big does happen, then, you know, that would be amazing. And his gentle voice carries a strong message. What I really appreciate about what I do now is I get to listen to the elders. I hear a lot of stories from the elders and, and I can re relate to a lot of their stories because I grew up that way too. Cherokee speaker and radio host Dennis Sixkiller archives Cherokee history, culture, and traditions from the mouths of our elders. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong, learning, growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker, OCO, and welcome to the Cherokee Nation. We're so proud to share our stories with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. In this episode, we'll take you from rural Oklahoma to the streets of New York City and introduce you to three Cherokee Nation citizens leaving a mark on the world around them. Colby Britton grew up in the Cherokee Nation, but work as a model took him to New York City. We were there with Colby after his first big break into the fashion and modeling industry. Hi, Hi I'm, I'm Jennifer. Nice to meet you, Jennifer, cool. Colby. All right, so what are we doing today? Photo shoot for the portfolio. People ask me how I got into it and you know, I would go to the mall or I would or I would just be somewhere and people would be like, like, are you model? Do you model? And I was always like, no. Like I got that comment so many times that I, I told my mom, I was like, mom, I was like, I was like, this has gotta be like a sign from God that like I need to go out and do this because like I've got this so many times, like there's no way that if I go do it, it can be wrong. Ended up signing with Kim Dawson. They're an agency in Dallas. Uh, they handle talent, they handle um, voiceover, they handle fashion runway. They've basically taken me under their wing and just kind of showed me the ropes. One of the first things I ever learned was like not to wear socks, like tight socks because then you got like sock lines so you know it shows up on camera. I was born and raised in Tahlequah, um, 18 years until I left to Dallas. And I think once you're in the same place for so long, especially in a small town, um, you kind of like um, forget about everything that's actually there. Once I moved to Dallas, I realized that, and now every time I come home, I really I really just enjoy being home and say I love Tahlequah. I left Tahlequah at, you know, I was like 18 years old, and then, I mean, here I am in Dallas living by myself. It was a little tough for a while because I didn't know anybody. I didn't know where I was going, you know, but um, I got it figured out, and I met some friends, and it all worked out. Really slow at first, and I was kind of worried about it. But the first year uh, up until now, it's been it's been pretty busy. So now I'm going to New York, so it worked out. Starting out in New York as you know a new face, you have to uh, um, put in your time and um, build yourself up. I've been here for you know less than two months and I've worked um, several times. I've got a, a couple clients that I've been working for repetitively, so that's really good too. I came across him while discussing his book 
and whether we should represent him or not and determined that he would be a good one to uh, represent and get him to that level of success that we expect from all of our models. This is the first year that they had Men's Fashion Week by itself, usually it's in September with the women's, but they did uh, exclusive uh, uh, this year for the first time. I booked this this show for us, Park and Ronin, and you know it was a really fun uh, experience. A park and Ronin's like um, swimwear slash beachwear. Um, it's very like casual. Most of the stuff we wore in the show was uh, you know swimwear. It was definitely a fun experience. I've been a little bit of a tourist. Um, I went to the Whitney Museum the other day. Uh, that was pretty cool. Going to like the World Trade Center and you know like the Chelsea Piers over where I played basketball. It's just a really nice running area. So it's like it's just taking in all the sights. There's so many people that. Every day, like every moment, you can you always see somebody different. You always see you know something different. Like everybody's from you know a, a different background. They have a different culture, a different heritage. So it's like um, you know I I walk around. People are like, "Where are you from?" I'm like, "Oklahoma." And they're like, "Oh, that's cool." And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm, you know I'm Native American. I'm Cherokee." And they're like, "What is that?" When I walk around, you see so many different people from so many different places every day. Uh, you really wonder, you know, what, what it's like in their culture. So it's like, um, it makes you think about your culture as their, uh, and theirs as well. So it's, it's crazy just because there's so many, you know, so many different people. Overall, I would say, you know, it's been a really, um, it's been a really good trip here. And I'm, I'm excited to go home for a little bit and then come back for good. You know, I'd really like to, get really lucky and you know make it really big and make a lot of money and be famous and that type of thing but at the same time it's like you know you want to make it big make a lot of money you know be really successful but it's just I don't think you can look at it that way I think the best way to look at it is just come up here and enjoy the fact that you know I live in New York City at 19 years old and I'm able to make money um, I just try to live every day and just realize that I'm really blessed with what I have and that, you know, if something big does happen, then, you know, that would be amazing. Verna Bates is well known throughout the Cherokee Nation as an artist with her hands in all different kinds of art. But Verna is probably most well known for the masks she makes out of the gourds grown right here in her garden and of course for her laugh. Grandmother could speak, uh, she was fluent. In my Cherokee name, she gave it to me when I was born. Gataya, and a lot of people will ask me, what does it mean? And I would love to be able to tell them that it means something romantic like babbling brook or what have you, but it simply means Verna. My husband says it means running mouth, <laughs> but, but that's not true. <laughs> I'm Verna Bates, and I'm a Cherokee artist specializing in gourd art. Uh, this is my studio, Gourds Etc. I have five siblings. One of them was uh, working as a an artist. She brought me this dipper gourd, and she la handed it to me, and she laughed, and she said, here, see what you can do with this. Turned around and walked away. I put it up on a shelf and left it there. It probably laid there for close to a year. And then one day I take it down, cleaned it up, and that was the beginning. I started out with the dipper gourds, and then I added um, the gourd bowls. Just about, I think maybe six or seven years ago now, I don't know, time gets away from me, I started making the Cherokee masks. Uh, some are made 
in the more traditional may way in that they're hand stitched. This guy right here has wood burn tattoos on his face. They're ancient designs. A long time ago, after we were exposed to the Europeans to kind of build up our self-esteem, we would create masks to mock, to make fun of those who put us down or put us in those bad situations. I incorporate the uh, designs, the ancient designs and the syllabary because I am proud of my Cherokee heritage. The designs that I use, the ancient ones, that's art that someone hundreds of years ago made. And so all I'm doing is, is duplicating, so to say, what they've done and I'm showing off what good artists we had beforehand. I'm just proud of what we've done. But when people come to visit me here, if they buy a piece of art, wonderful. But if they don't, because of the stories, because of the, the designs, what have you, and the, and the inf information that I give them about this, if they don't buy a piece of art, they're still leaving with some education. So it's not just being an artist, you're being a teacher, so you need to know what you're talking about. My husband has been awesome, and he gets out there and he does all the tilling and the weeding, and, and uh, he's grown all my gourds all these years since then. Myrna has a contagious personality. Very sincere, very enthusiastic about everything she does in life. She is so compassionate about her artwork that I can't help but support her to whatever limit it takes, you know, whatever she desires to do. She puts her whole heart into it. My husband is my hero. Uh, we've been uh, together 23 years, working on 24. I've never known anybody so kind, um, had so much peace, I guess, and he's my partner in crime. We do everything together. I tell people that if um, we, if there's ever a car wreck and you only find one, you gotta look, there's the other ones there somewhere. <laughs> We're always together. He's very supportive, very supportive. He's not only supplied me with my gourds, we have visitors that come and purchase these from us. This year, we decided to grow some heirloom dipper gourds. An heirloom, it is an old, old variety. It's, uh, it's part of your past. So it is, yeah, it's very special. I have um, four grandchildren. The two younger ones, Tanner and Tucker, are following in my artistic footsteps, if you will, and I can't help but just beam with pride. I'm amazed at how much they improve each year. If I don't teach them about their culture, their heritage, their history, it's gonna get lost. I want them to be excited and know as much as they can possibly know about themselves so that one day when they're adults, they can pass this on to their children and grandchildren. I, I love what I do. There's never a boring moment. Before I go to an art show, my heart still just flutters. I'm still so excited. And I still say that when the time comes that I no longer get excited about the arts, I'm gonna quit, and I will. But until then, I'm hanging in there. On September 16, 1893, a settler named William S. Prettyman captured historic images of the final Oklahoma land run before joining in the race himself. Historians say up to 125,000 people lined up that day, on horseback with wagons and on foot, taking off at the sound of gunshots to claim their own piece of the six plus million acres offered up by the federal government. That land belonged to the Cherokee Nation just months before, granted to the tribe through the treaties of 1828 and 1835. It was called the Cherokee Outlet, seven million acres that extended 220 miles along the northern border of present-day Oklahoma. When the treaties were written, the government guaranteed that this land would be part of the tribe's permanent home out west. But after the American Civil War, the federal government changed its mind and purchased more than six million acres of the outlet for $1.40 an acre, less than half of what the Cherokees believed it was worth. 
President Grover Cleveland designated September 16, 1893 as the date of the run, which was the largest land opening in U.S. history. Jalagi Iniwanihi, let's talk Cherokee. First phrase in English. Tell me in Cherokee. Jalagi ha hino herling. Tell me in Cherokee. Jalagi ha hino herling. Say it again. Sigwu jinihiwi. Say it again. Sigwu jinihiwi. Say it slow. Uskanoli niwi. Say it slow. Uskanoli niwi. Dennis Sixkiller is the voice of the Cherokee people as the host of the nation's radio show, Cherokee Voices, Cherokee Sounds. The show is broadcast in both Cherokee and English and archives the fading voices of our elders. My name is Dennis Sixkiller, and I'm a translator specialist, and also do a radio program for called uh, Turkey Voices and Turkey Sounds. There's a guy had has lost his son a few years ago that I knew as I grew up in Jay, and I was living in Tahlequah just a few years ago, and I called back home, and I told him I was sorry to hear about his loss. And he said, Dennis, what do you do now? I said, uh, I do... Uh, translations and then do a race program for Cherokee Nation. He said, he got quiet for a second and said, how'd you get so smart? <laughs> I said, I didn't. He said, I have a lot of people fooled. Because <laughs> he remembered me the way I was back then. <laughs> done that. Mm. Oh, she didn't have done that, Ellie. Yeah, at least good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, didn't they all ask? You got this? It's a lot uneasy like that. You got can you on that? But I never dreamed I'd be doing what I'm doing now. But what I really appreciate about what I do now is I get to listen to the elders. I hear a lot of stories from the elders, and and I can re relate to a lot of their stories because I grew up that way too. I was born and raised in Jay, Oklahoma, in a two-room house. There was uh, seven uh, children and uh, with our parents and we didn't have no running water or any electricity. Actually, when I was a kid, it wasn't too bad because I didn't know a whole lot better than that. Than that. But when I think about it now, you know, yeah, it's, it was rough, it was hard. And every time we got in trouble, one of us got in trouble like that. He was sitting down in electrics in Cherokee, all in Cherokee, and uh, I used to hate that. I was like, it was like for hours, but it's probably about five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever at the most, you know, but man, that was worse than getting a spanking. We get up early, but in order to listen to the radio, but this is just my normal routine. The rain sounds good through the window. <laughs> it's it's really good. I mean, I, we don't we try not to miss it. <laughs> I used to work on Sunday mornings, and just right before I left, well, uh, Dennis would start giving the words out, and I'd run and I'd get the get paper and copy it, then out the door I would go to work. <laughs> it's just strange. We have to move the radio from corner to corner to try to get us a good station or hold it up in the air. Sometimes we take turns holding it. 
But when the turkey words come on, we have to sit, find a place to sit it down. Now it's time for turkey words. And before I give you the words, I'll give you the turkey vowels. We have six vowels in our language. We have the A, E, I, O, U, and V. And here are their sounds. All, A, E. In the home, it was all turkey. I never, honestly, I can, I can often say that my mom and dad, to each other, they never spoke any English that I know of. They couldn't hear uh, uh, turkey songs, all the songs on the radio or in Turkey. I like to keep it that way because a lot of people do appreciate these songs. Back in 1973, they recorded uh, Elder singing, and the first time I, saw, I put that on here, I just started crying, because you know, <sighs> I thought about all of our elders, you know, how, how they're gone on, and I could still hear them singing. And still see him sitting there. Made my heart feel good though, in a way. But on the other hand, it's sad. And because one was my uncle, was Sam Hyder. And he could really sing, and, and I just. Miss those times, you know. It's about all I can say about that. It was real touching. Don't think about those, isn't it? <laughs> and that's why this program is so important to me. That's it. <laughs> well, you know what time it is. Time for its part ways again already. It goes by pretty quick, doesn't it? And I want to thank each and one of you for tuning in today to join me. I always appreciate that. And call in sometimes and let me know about it. And if you're a speaker, call me. And if you want to talk on the radio, I'll sure come to your house and visit you. We can talk all the turkey you want. You might want to sing a song or two if you're a singer. I had a little bit of rain this year recently, and it's always good to have rain. I wonder why it always rains right after I mow my lawn. Sometimes I wonder. I guess that's how it goes sometimes, isn't it? Until next week. Please take care. Well done. We hope you enjoyed our show, and remember you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at OCO.TV. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye, because we know we'll see you again. So until next time, Wado. With breathtaking views along the scenic Illinois River, the excitement of a traditional game of stickball, and the vibrant history and culture of the largest Native American tribe in the United States, Cherokee Passport is your all-access pass to adventure. It's your turn to explore the 66,000 acres that make up Cherokee Nation. From the natural beauty of our lakes and rivers to engaging cultural attractions, there is history and beauty around every corner. The Cherokee National Supreme Court Museum. It's the oldest government building in the state of Oklahoma, built in 1844, not long after the Cherokees forced removal into Indian Territory. Along with the Cherokee National Supreme Court, this historic building housed the printing press of the Cherokee Advocate, the first newspaper in Oklahoma. Today, visitors to the museum learn about the early establishment of Cherokee governance and see firsthand how Oklahoma's oldest newspaper was created. 
The Cherokee National Prison Museum. Built in 1875, the Cherokee National Prison Museum offers visitors a glimpse into the unique history of Indian Territory. During the tumultuous years of 1875 to 1901, this was the only prison in all of Indian Territory. Today, visitors to the museum learn about infamous outlaws, the wrongfully accused, and can view a replicated 19th century jail cell. The John Ross Museum and Ross Cemetery. The John Ross Museum highlights the life of John Ross, perhaps the most well-known principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. The museum houses exhibits on the Trail of Tears, the Civil War, the Cherokee Golden Age, and about Cherokee Nation's passion for the education of its people since time immemorial. Next to the museum, the historic Ross Cemetery, the burial place of Principal Chief John Ross and his family, numerous high-ranking leaders of the Cherokee Nation, and several survivors of the Trail of Tears. Sequoia's Cabin Museum. Located in Salisaw, Oklahoma, Sequoia's Cabin Museum was renovated by Cherokee Nation in 2017. Renowned Cherokee statesman and inventor of the Cherokee syllabary, Sequoia built this one-room log cabin in 1829. Surrounded by a lush 10-acre park, visitors to the museum will find relics and documents associated with Sequoia's life and learn more about the revolutionary Cherokee syllabary. The Cherokee Heritage Center. Built in 1967, the Cherokee Heritage Center includes the Cherokee National Museum, where visitors learn the tribe's history from our original homelands in the southeastern United States to present-day Oklahoma. Visitors can also take a living history tour through Diligua, a traditional Cherokee village set in the year 1710. Also on site, Adams Corner Rural Village, the Cherokee Family Research Center, Cherokee National Archives, and a gift shop. Ready to discover the Cherokee Nation for yourself? Learn more about the Cherokee Passport at visitcherokeenation.com and receive admission to five Cherokee Nation museums and more. In the Cherokee Nation, news happens every day. Cherokee Nation's economic impact on the state of Oklahoma now exceeds $2 billion. The dollars that are generated here are creating jobs. It benefits everyone. Creating headlines. The new 469,000 square foot health facility is the result of the largest joint venture agreement ever. For the people of the Cherokee Nation, it will impact them for generations to come. Creating opportunities. Cherokee Nation employees can now take eight weeks of paid maternity leave. We have lots of young mothers and young families, and this is something that's very exciting. This year, the tribe awarded $5 million to superintendents from about 100 public school districts. When it comes to education, we're all in it together. Creating a better place to call home. The Wilma P. Mankiller Health Center in Stillwell, Oklahoma, nearly doubled in size. But this absolutely will make a tremendous impact on the quality of life. It's going to provide more jobs. For more Cherokee Nation news, visit onadiscoe.com.